Hi, we're live from Goddard Space Flight Center. I'm Erin Kislik, and today we're celebrating 25 years of Hubble servicing. So you may be wondering what servicing is. It's just like when you take your car in to get the tires rotated or the oil changed or even just fuel up. Some type satellites in space need a little bit of help too. With us today, we have astronauts who went on the first servicing mission to Hubble 25 years ago this week, and they're about to tell you a little bit about their experience, so hang on tight. Good morning. I'm Dr. Ken Carpenter, the operations project scientist for Hubble. At the time uh, of the servicing mission one, I was the operations co-I for the Goddard High Resolution Spectrograph, and I must say appreciated the repair to GHRS that was done in the mission as well. Um, and I also a relatively fresh operations project scientist for the project overall at that point. We've heard what the atmosphere was like during that time and the challenges uh, from the many previous speakers. Now we will hear from the people who actually made it happen in space. SM Long was launched on the 2nd of December, 1993. As you know, the mission restored the Spaceborne Observatory's optical performance, correcting for the spherical aberration with the installation of uh, WIFPIC-2 and COSTAR. The flight also started, installed new gyros and solar arrays on the telescope, in addition to the GHRS fix. There were seven astronauts on STS-61, Richard Covey, Kenneth Bowersox, Catherine Thornton, Claude Nicolier, Jeffrey Hoffman, Story Musgrave, and Tom Akers. Two of these brave and amazing astronauts are here with us today uh, to tell of their experiences in orbit on the mission which saved the Hubble Space Telescope. I'm going to introduce both of them and then we'll let them get into their uh, speeches directly. Um, Catherine Thornton earned her PhD at the University of Virginia in 1979 and became an astronaut in July 1985. Her initial assignments included flight software verification in the Shuttle Avionics Integration Laboratory, serving as a member, a team member of the Vehicle Integration Test Team at Kennedy and as a spacecraft communicator or CAPCOM. Kathy was a mission specialist on four shuttle flights. Her first was the Department of Defense classified mission. Her second was on the maiden voyage of Space Shuttle Endeavor and helped repair the Intelsat and uh, also evaluated space station assembly techniques. On her fourth and final flight, Dr. Thornton served on the, as payload commander on the second U.S. microgravity laboratory mission. But today, of course, we're concentrating on her third flight, uh, which, on which Dr. Thornton was a mission specialist for the HST servicing mission. On the flight, she installed COSTAR, uh, which you've heard about earlier, uh, also disposed of in a scene worthy of a ballet, uh, one of the solar arrays. And I still, every time I see that video clip, hear the Blue Danube because of a German ARD t TV station which set that scene to that music. Mm. She has logged over 975 hours in space, including more than 21 hours of uh, extravehicular activity and is currently a professor of mechanical and aerospace engineering at the University of Virginia. Jeffrey Hoffman received a PhD from Harvard University in 1971 and became an astronaut in August 1979. During preparations for the shuttle, shuttle orbital test flights, he worked in the flight simulation laboratory at Downey, California, testing guidance, navigation, and flight control systems. He served as a support crew member for STS-5 and as a CAPCOM for STS-8 and 82. Jeff is a veteran of five shuttle flights. On his first mission, he made the first STS contingency spacewalk. His second flight was a space lab mission flying the Astro-1 UV astronomy package. His third space flight was as payload commander and mission specialist uh, on STS-46, which deployed the European retrievable carrier and carried out the first test flight of the tethered satellite system. His fourth, fourth flight was SM-1, uh, on which he conducted three EVAs, including the installation of WIFPIC-2. He did one more flight after SM-1 on STS-75, which did a reflight of the tethered satellite system and the third flight of the U.S. microgravity payload. He has logged more than 1,200 hours and 21.5 million miles in space. He is currently a professor in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at MIT, and is the author of a book titled An Astronaut's Diary. Please join me in enthusi enthusiastically welcoming Dr. Katherine Thornton and Dr. Jeffrey Hoffman.
Thanks, Ken. Are, uh, are we live? Good. Um, you know, just before we start, a 25th anniversary, I mean, it's great to come here and see old friends and colleagues, but, uh, you know, we're both professors, so I don't know if you have the same sort of shock that I do when I, I talk to my students now about Hubble and realize they weren't born when we did this. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it uh, sort of makes us remember where, <laughs> where we are. Yeah, I think well, what, what we would like to do, um, we, we have a few pictures, most of which you've probably seen before, but to try to give a sense of what it was like being the crew that was going to go up and, and do this. And, and of course, as a crew, um, we're the people that the public sees more than anyone else, but we're probably more aware than any of the public of how many people were involved in the success of this mission. And, and that's why it's great to be here and, and that everybody's had a chance to review all the incredible contributions that so many people made. So, you know, when we started out, um, th this was one thing that, that maybe uh, didn't get mentioned so much, that Hubble, you know, it, a, a servicing telescope, there was so much new technology involved um, there were a lot of problems and, and um, you know, there was a lot of criticism of, of Hubble, just like there is now of the Webb Telescope, which also has so much new technology. It's, it's a lesson that, uh, you know, I, I don't know how you deal with, with Congress and, and the political and budget people knowing when you set out on trying to do something that's so new and so complicated almost certainly you're going to run into problems, but you know, how do you prepare the people for that? Um, but anyway, um, you know, we, we were both flying, so you know, we weren't really directly involved with, with Hubble uh, in the early days, but um, that, that's an, another thing that, that um, you know, we have to realize. There, there were people even before Hubble was, uh, was launched. I mean, Bruce McCandless, Kathy Sullivan, they had spent a lot of time working on what the repair procedures would be. And uh, and of course, there was the big shock. And again, we weren't directly involved in any of this until we got, uh, you know, people figured out what the problems w uh, were and, and how we were going to fix them. And then, of course, within the astronaut office, um, we, we as, as NASA people, had to bear the brunt as, as well as, as all the astronomers. And, you know, I was originally trained as an astronomer, so I, I kept getting um, messages from astronomer friends telling me that even that summer, they were embarrassed when, you'd, you know, you'd go away in the summer and people would, you'd meet new people, you know, what do you do for a living? They said, I don't want to say that I'm an astronomer because somehow they hold me responsible for Hubble. So, you know, we all lived through that together. But then um, once we were getting ready, uh, this was the, uh, the big question around the astronaut office. And uh, because it was so critical to any, anything you could think of that would reduce the risk of failure, NASA was ready to do. And so they made this decision, this was for the first servicing mission that was relaxed later on. But, um, you know, I'll, I'll tell my story and then you can uh, take it. But um, at, as was mentioned on, on my first flight, uh, it was not a, uh, an EVA flight. We were just deploying two satellites. Um, I always remember as we got out of the water tank, before, this was the last EVA training session before our flight. And just as a joke, I said to all of the technicians around there, I said, well, guys, if we actually get to do an EVA, there's a beer party at the outpost on us. <laughs> and sure enough, um, one of the satellites didn't turn off, and they sent us up to attach those fly swatters to the end of the arm, using that same strapping tool, by the way, that. Um, People ask me, what's my favorite tool? So this was our uh, strapping tool here. And then, of course, you heard about the strapping tool for closing the doors, same thing. So no question, that was my favorite tool. And uh, we did give the beer party when we came back. It was well worth it. And the 
critical thing was um, I had my EVA union card. And so, you know, you, you had your own EVA experience. Yeah. I was on the um, first flight of Endeavor where we went up to capture the Inelsat satellite, strap a new booster motor on it, and send it on its way. And that one is memorable and remarkable for all the things that went wrong before we finally successfully did get it deployed. And that satellite, um, this was in May of 92, and that satellite carried the Summer Olympics from Barcelona that same summer. Um, we, we did the first and only three-person EVA, sending three guys out the, to, to grab it with their hands because the capture bar, for lots of reasons, didn't work. And it was ultimately successful, but it was considered to be um, we were called the Cowboy EVA crew because we did things that were somewhat unconventional and number one, NASA headquarters was determined that they were not going to have any Cowboy EVAs on this HST mission and number two, they wanted only experienced EVA crew members on it. Well, as it turns out, the EVA experience in the office was kind of thin at that time, so they got me and Tom Akers from the Cowboy EVA group <laughs> on the mission. I love this picture. We look so young. I love it. <laughs> Yeah, zero um, gravity helps that a lot. <laughs> yeah, uh, much better than Botox, actually. Um, yeah, the four of us with mustaches tried to, to convince Story and Claude to grow one, but un unsuccessful. No, we, we, didn't give, we didn't give Kathy any, any grief. But in, in any case, um, you know, a tremendous amount of time training. Um, you know, Claude uh, Nicolier, who was a, a European astronaut, because, of course, the, the Europeans um, had contributed to Hubble, and it was great. And Claude had um, flown actually with me on, on my third flight, his first flight, and, and had operated the arm for the deployment of, of Eureka, and, and was, uh, you know, he did it with the precision of a Swiss watchmaker. And uh, so he, he was, it was great to have him on the flight. Um, and we, uh, we actually introduced virtual reality as a training tool for the first time. It was um, pretty clunky, and the scenes only updated about once a second, so you had to move really slowly as you moved around. But, you know, you move pretty slowly when you're out doing EVA. Um, for the, the spacewalkers, of course, the, the main work goes on underwater. Um, we were kind of unique here because um, we did our, most of our EVA training at the Marshall Space Flight Center because they had a really deep pool and the uh, neutral buoyancy facility had not yet been built at, at Johnson. So it was, it was really unique. You remember we, we would be away for a long time and, and instead of training in Houston and going home every night, we, we were staying at the resident and we'd get up early in the morning. We'd, we'd, after breakfast, we'd go and we'd sit all sit around the table with our trainers and, you know, they'd have the Hubble models and we'd go through in great detail, this is what we're going to do today, this is what we want to learn, this is what we're investigating, and then we'd do the, uh, the, the water run and, and the two of us who were not in spacesuits would usually scuba for part of it, and uh, then afterwards we'd um, sit around and, and have a debrief then we'd all go to the gym, then we'd have dinner, and then we'd sit around in the hot tub and talk about what we were going to do the next day. And, we were speaking and, in acronyms and waving our hands, and anyone who wasn't connected with us left. Yeah, the other people in the hot tub, they never lasted. <laughs> but it, it really did build up a team, and, and um, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that it was pleasant being away from the families for all that time, but um, it, it was certainly it was the first mission, and, and we knew how unique and, and important it, it was. Uh, yeah, you've all, you've all seen this, um, the practicing on, on the whiff pick, and, and you know, just how to get yourself in, in just the right position. Uh, Story referred to what we were doing as choreography, which, I, which we, we kind of liked that idea, that, you know, just to be one or two inches in a different position so you can't quite reach what you're trying to get to could make all the difference. Um, and of course, we wanted to get uh, experience with the actual hardware, so we, we spent a lot of time up, up here at Goddard. Um, you know, this, this was Hubble, and, and one of the incredible things working on it was everybody was working in the same direction. Um, I know I had had experience 
working with Marshall and Johnson, and there were always certain, you know, conflicts. I don't know about your experience with, with the military, or whatever. But, um, but none of that, you know, here everybody was, was whatever it took. Um, you know, you've heard about the development of the new tools. I mean, we, we could be in the water tank. Um, you know, if, if my wrench had a, you know, instead of a 10 degree bend, a 20 degree bend, I could save a little time and have an easier access to that bolt. And darned if the next week you'd come in and sure enough, you'd have a new tool. I mean, the, 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 it was just phenomenal. And everything here, remember, every, every tool we had, we had to test on every bolt. Yeah. And when we worked in the water tank, the things didn't go as smoothly as they would in real life because it's been corroding in a chlorine pool forever. And, and you still have the weight. Even though you're floating in the pool, you still have the weight of everything. So pushing in the whiff pick and pushing in the CoStar was really a, a muscular event. You had to put a lot of effort behind it. And we knew that wasn't going to be real. And then we came up here and did fit checks, and we watched those instruments being put into the high-fidelity simulator. But, but they're then suspended from cranes because they're heavy. They're not going to float here. And so it's a combination of those two that made, made the mission successful, and in particular, the high-fidelity simulator up here, that, that we got a chance to fit everything that we could possibly fit on and get confidence it was going to work. But do you remember? Um, yes. <laughs> the first time we put the whiff pick in, uh, you know, it's suspended and, and we're, we're pushing it in and it got about halfway in, wouldn't go any further. And, you know, they took it out. It turned out that the, the thermal covering on it, uh, the thermal, sh uh, you know, the Kapton the um, whiff pick was sort of like that and they had put the covering at a, at a, on a diagonal. And, and that's why it wouldn't, wouldn't fit in. And, and they went back, and, and sure enough, it turned out that with pick one had had that same problem, because that's the way the drawing had been. And so they fixed with pick one, but they had never changed the drawing. So with pick two, uh, so they, they quickly fixed that, and, and it went in. Yeah. And then remember, we tried to put CoStar I remember in. CoStar, we had hit a hard stop as well. And it turned out there was a bolt head or something that was a 1G thing. That well, we didn't not, know if it was 1G. I mean, the, 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 the specs <coughs> said that it was supposed to be a recessed bolt. But everybody said, well, we built the high fidelity simulator to the same specs as, as we built the original telescope. So we didn't really know. I guess when you took out the, the first coaster, the, the, the photometer, you could see that the, the bolt was re recessed. But, you know, when, when you think about neither the whiff pick nor the CoStar went in to the high fidelity simulator the first time we, we uh, went to install them. Um, and the other thing, uh, you remember we had our helmets and, and we wanted to see what would it look like at night? How much visibility would we have at night? So could you turn out all the lights in the room? Oh boy, the safety people, no way. You can't possibly do that, much too dangerous. But this was Hubble, and, and they did it, and, and uh, it was little things like that. The other thing that I remember from on one of our, our meetings, uh, uh, one of our trips up here to Goddard, we got a message. We, we were to go down to NASA headquarters to meet with Dan Golden. Remember that? So there were the seven of us in, in his office, facing him behind his desk, and he just looked at us and he said, I hope you realize that the future of NASA's human space flight program depends on the success of your mission. So, you know, no pressure. Right. People sort of asked us, did we find extra prey? I don't know how you felt about it. I, I felt like we as the crew were shielded by Milt and by other folks from a lot of the independent reviews and things that were going on outside of our training. And we were largely left alone, at least I felt we were. To, to train, to learn what we needed to do to accomplish the mission. Yeah, that, that's the thing. The first thing that, that any of these independent reviews would want to do is, oh, we got to go talk with the crew. And after the first two or three, we, that was just going to take too much time. So yeah, we, we were pretty well shielded. Um, let, let's move along. Um, so yeah, this is all that always that exciting moment when. By the way, you're not normally planes are not allowed to fly over the uh, the launch pad, but they always make an exception when the astronauts come down in the T-38s. They they love to see a circle around the launch pad. And then, uh, 
Yeah, we did try on the 1st of December, but the winds were too high. It, it, there was a total eclipse of the moon. Remember that night? I do. Which, well, I'm an astronomer, so I, I pay attention. But well, what's that thing up there? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, whether that was a, a bad <coughs> omen for the 1st of December or a good omen for the success of our mission, who knows? But uh, we did go up. And um, yeah, I mean, we were. Um, we had all been in space before, and, and so we could really get right to work. We knew what we were doing. There's one moment that I remember vividly, and that's when we were in quarantine in Houston. Oh. Just before we left, we were on a sleep shift, so we were up at, got up at like 2 o'clock in the morning, was our normal wake up. And it was the morning that we left to fly to the Cape. We all went outside at about 3 o'clock in the morning and watched Hubble fly over. Yeah. Remember that? And thinking, in three days, we're going to be right there. Well, the other story about that was when we were waiting. Uh, we were up. We were in the shuttle, but all the the spectators were waiting. And my my brother, who's a space nut, told me about this. He said, shortly before our launch, they all saw Hubble fly over, and and they said that gave them a good feeling because they figured NASA knew what they were doing. You know, <laughs> everything worked. But yeah, we had we had four spacesuits because we were all different sizes, so we really couldn't. And so. <laughs> The airlock was, was pretty uh, crammed up. Uh, we talked a lot about tools, and, and the tools you know, just absolutely uh, extraordinary. And, and you, you heard the story about how um, not too many months before the flight, we, we had the idea, you know, instead of having to go out to the aft of the shuttle, load up with the tools, do our work, go back, put the tools in the tool chest, and then come back in, wouldn't it be easier if we had all the tools inside? And um, normally the response would have been, no way, we've done the weight and balance, everything is checked, we, we can't, all the drawings are done. But again, this was Hubble, and darned if they didn't do it. And that first day when we couldn't get the doors closed, that really made a difference, because uh, we were out over eight hours, and I know my electrical power was starting to go off the, uh, the curve. So. Uh, but one thing we made sure is that, that every tool from, that was inside the crew module that we would need was moved into the airlock before we depressed it. So we did have access to every single tool. It made it a little crowded in the airlock, but we made sure that that was the case every single day. And of course, every one of those tools has to be tethered, and, and just learning how to do all that was a big difference. Taking care of our suits. Um, I guess you had already been trained on multiple EVAs. I, I had, uh, there, there are a lot of special procedures when you have to use your spacesuits more than once on a mission. And uh, the, other, the other thing, you know, after they, they were very interested in, in um, it, it had been determined that doing five EVAs in a row was too much for just a normal two-person crew. That's why there were four of us and two EVA crews. But, the EVAs were so well designed, uh, you know, the, the tasks that we had to do. Uh, I know I, I felt probably you at, at the end of every EVA, if, if, I think if I had had to go out the next day, I could have done it. I think we all felt that way. Ed mentioned that Story was anxious to get out early on the first day, and we did every single day because as designed, our EVA, we would have been going EVA during the time the shuttle passed through the South Atlantic anomaly which would have increased our radiation exposure significantly. And so every single day we got up and tried to get out earlier than the flight plan called for, which I'm sure drove <coughs> Milt's teams crazy because they then had to replan all the maneuvers as we were leaving. But we did manage to get out, do all the EVAs, and get back in before we passed through that South Atlantic anomaly. The crews that were not going EVA did, tried to do everything in the morning. So the EVA team only had to get up, eat their breakfast, get dressed, and then climb in the suits that were prepared for them. Uh, no one else even had a chance to eat. So we were very busy in trying to do that. And I think for those five days, we overall as a crew didn't eat very well and didn't take care of ourselves very well because we were totally focused on, on that timeline and getting things done. We did rest a little bit after we got it deployed. We got a, a day, I think, to sort of recoup before we deorbited. But it was a busy, busy time up there for everybody. Well, I'll take exception to the eating. I, I always <laughs> ate, ate okay. a lot. Jeff ate fine. Especially breakfast. The rest of us did not. Um, I, I always eat a big breakfast, and I knew I wasn't going to get anything to eat for the next eight hours, so I always made sure to, that, I, that I got a good breakfast. Um, 
Yeah, we, uh, Kathy mentioned radiation. You know, Hubble, Hubble is uh, higher than, than any other shuttle orbit, so uh, we were sort of scraping the inner edge of the uh, radiation belts, and it was predicted we were going to get about 10 times the normal dose, which is still nothing to get concerned about, but they, they did have us wear special uh, radiation monitors at various places in our body just so that we could, um, that they, they could get a better sense of, of what the dosage really was. And then the, the typical process of, of going in, um, in, in the early days of EVA, uh, we only wore the, uh, the liquid cooling garments, but um, we knew we were going to be spending a lot of time in the shadow and it could get pretty cold, so we wore uh, underneath that a set of thermal underwear, sort of, sort of like you wear when you go skiing, except it's made of Nomex, because of course the, the atmosphere inside a spacesuit is pure <coughs> oxygen, and so flammability is, is a big concern. And then, uh, you know, getting in the suits, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a squeeze. Um, you get some sense there of, of how many tools we had to carry out, and of course you have to do a pre-breathe of pure oxygen for 40 minutes before you can depress your suit. And then... Um, the movie? The movie was supposed to start automatically. Let's see. I don't think we'll show the entire movie in the interest of time, but um, just maybe take us through the first two EVAs so they can see, see both of us. Um, NASA graphics get more and more fancy, but anyway, yeah, 4 a.m. launch. Um, it's like watching a artificial sunrise. And that's the Earth from 600 kilometers, starting right away. Kathy was having a bad hair day. <laughs> Every day. Every day is bad Just hair sure day. Just story does as well. Yeah. Uh, power tools, of course, were absolutely critical. Uh, pilot and commander, they've got to do the rendezvous, find Hubble, capture it. Yeah, it's really exciting when you first see it as a little point of light, and then it gets bigger and bigger. And then Claude does his stuff. And of course, we didn't have the HD cameras that they take up nowadays, so this is all uh, old-fashioned resolution. But you now getting, getting everything ready. And then, uh, you know, at, at this point is when it sort of hits you, all that preparation, and now uh, the very first day of the first EVA, and uh, you know, Story and I had had actually changed the procedure that was originally recommended for for doing the uh, the gyros, where uh, instead of having to remove the, the the sunshades, which would have taken a lot more time, uh, I sort of inserted Story underneath, and and then. He, I would loosen the bolts, he would remove the, the RSU package and um, then hand, hand it to me. I'd hand him the new one, he'd put it in place, I'd, I'd put the bolts on and then when we were all finished, very gently, because remember he can't see what's behind him and he's inside all of this complex machinery and none of us wanted to be known as the, someone who broke something on Hubble that wasn't already broken, that, that would be a bad deal. Uh, and those are the, the thermal enclosures that, that you heard about. Um, this is now putting the old gyro packages back. We all cross-trained for every single task, so if during the night... Um... And, and this is the door problem, by the way. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in detail, I think, maybe this afternoon. Okay. If, if the team had decided to reschedule events for the next day and say, oh, we're not doing solar rays today, we're doing something else. We were all prepared to jump in and do all, all of the tasks. Um, yeah, I, I just, you know, Milt described his feeling when he heard that the doors didn't close when, um, when I, I my, my, son, my two sons said, Jeff, you missed a real opportunity. You should have called down Houston. We have a problem. But, didn't think yeah. of that at the time. You, you take the solar array part. <clears throat> so you just saw the first solar array roll up correctly, and this is the second one. And as soon as Covey saw the, bl the blankets go 
kind of slack, he stopped the retraction. It's because the, there was a kink in the by stem that wouldn't let it roll up. So Tom and I knew before we went out that day that we were going to be jettisoning that solar array. But it was in the plan. I mean, we had, we had thought of that before. We knew, yeah, we had a plan to do it. We knew for certain that it was going to happen. So we disconnected the solar array in darkness because that made the connection dead and then had to release it in light. I did take the tether off, and I made that call to the ground. Tether is off so you wouldn't think <laughs> I was going to be snug, tied to it. I just released it. I didn't push it off. I just let it go. We backed away from it. And then you can see when uh, Sox fired the jets to move us away from it that it... Uh, impinged on the array like and it just started flapping and cruising. Burn. It was incredible. We, we were mesmerized. It was turning somersaults. <coughs> I, I remember finally Tom called up from the cargo bay and said, hey, aren't we supposed to be doing some useful work? And like, oh yeah, snap out. <laughs> so we installed the new solar arrays on it and, and one of the connections we drove by hand because it was so critical that we didn't cross-thread it and totally kill the telescope. Yeah, th and this is the, the first of the optical corrections, uh, putting in the, the whiff pick. And for all of the potential problems that we were prepared for, it just worked beautifully. And, and by and large, that was true about the whole mission. We did have those few snags. And uh, again, if we have a chance later, we'll talk about the great screw chase on, on the uh, final EVA day. That was, that was pretty exciting. Um, but bringing this up, and I think we'll, we'll show CoStar and then we'll, we'll stop it. I would have bet money that w at least one of these instruments wouldn't have gone in on the first attempt and that we'd be do some, we would be yeah. doing some MacGyvering up there yeah. to make it work, but they were all... I mean, we had hacksaws and hammers and whatever it was going to take. <laughs> we, we were ready. Um, and I actually had had a call from someone I w won't name, but high up at the Space Telescope Science Institute fellow astronomer telling me, uh, you know, if you can only get in either with pick or CoStar, we'll consider the mission a success. But don't tell anyone I said that. Uh, and we didn't, and we did them both. And then the magnetometers, of course, simple magnetometers, they're never going to fail. And there's two of them anyway, and they both failed. And you couldn't remove them, so we had to put new ones on top of the old ones, disconnect the wiring from the old ones, wire up the new ones, and now Kathy and Tom are going to complete the optical repairs. Yeah. This is uh, EVA day four. When I came in from EVA two, I ended up with an ear block. And so I was sort of a, um, um, on the injured reserve for the next day, and it wasn't clear what I was, whether I was going to get EVA four, but um, they did let me go out. Uh, Tom is inside the telescope, and he's directing mostly Claude, but also me, on uh, how to hold it and, and up, down, right, left in order to get it in. I mean, it's a tight fit, look. And it just, it just floated in. It didn't have to do anything to it. I just sort of put my hands on it, and, and it just sort of want, it wanted to go in. It just floated straight in there. And then Tom latched it down. Uh, we also put some new memory on the computers up there and some other you know, cats and dogs, some other small things that we did while we were up there. So I think we'll, we'll move on. Um, after installing WIFPIC, uh, we, we had to wait. You don't get too much free time af out, out there, but uh, we, we had enough uh, time that I asked Claude to fly me out over the, um, the wing. And, and they had let us take one of the Apollo Hasselblad. I think that may have been the last time one of those Hasselblads flew, but we wanted to take one outside. So uh, just to share with people what it, what it looked like to be outside servicing Hubble. You can see story up there on the other side. And of course, the, the, it's a real wide angle camera, so it's all distorted. The Earth is not flat, believe me. Uh, and the orbiter's not shaped like a banana. Right. Um, although, I, I will say, from our orbit, normally we talk about going around every, every 90 minutes, 16 orbits a day. But we, we went around every 95 minutes because of Kepler's laws. It re they really work. And uh, you know, 15 orbits a day, but still. And every once in a while, it's just so beautiful up there. I mean, the sun, I don't know if this is a sunrise or a sunset, but you just got to, you know, I can't say smell the roses because you couldn't smell anything, but just watch, watch some of the beauty up there. And that's, that's the uh, kind of the image that um, Hubble is big, and particularly when you're looking at it from the bottom. And, uh, you know, to, when Story and I got to go up 
top of the telescope. That was just, um, you know, 50 feet may not sound like a long way from the orbiter, but it sure, sure felt that way. And it's not, not where you want to be if you have a sense of vertigo. Long, long way down. Um, yeah, just extraordinary experiences that uh, I think none of us will forget for the rest of our lives. And um, we call this our finished jewel. It sat in the cargo bay for a full day or more before we deployed it. And so we would just go up to the mid deck, I mean, the flight deck, and just look out the back window and just stare at it. So the only, the only other thing I'll share, um, you know, you, you heard from, from Ed about when, when they discovered that the pictures w were coming back and were working, but, but we didn't know that. Uh, but I'll never forget, it was, uh, it was New Year's Eve, and so no public announcements had been made, but we, uh, we were cleaning up from a party. It was about 1 o'clock in the morning. The phone rang. It was a, an old astronomer friend at the, at the Space Telescope Science Institute, uh, and after you know, wishing each other a uh, happy new year. He said, you know, Jeff, you have any champagne? And yeah, we had half a bottle still in the, in the refrigerator. So I said, well, we're really not supposed to tell anybody because a certain politician wants to make an announcement publicly in a few days. But we figured that the crew ought to know that, you know, we've got the pictures back and it works, which, of course, uh, we all knew. But that was the... Because we, of course, knew that, that we had gone up and done our job, uh, and many people had felt that this was such a complex mission that, I mean, at one point they were talking, you know, maybe they should split it into two, two missions because there were so many things we had to do, and, uh, you know, but, but we knew that all, everything we had done worked, and would the optics actually work? And so that was, um, you know, the rest, as they say, is, is history. It's, um, Something I think, uh, you know, I look back on it both as an astronomer and an astronaut as to have been able to put my two hands on Hubble in space, uh, you know, one of the high points of my life. You know. yeah, it's, it's nurtured a generation of young scientists. Ed mentioned to me when I, this morning that he reminded me that while I was in orbit, he was shepherding my family, my husband and three young daughters, through an early morning live interview on Good Morning America. Well, the oldest of those, who was 11 at that time when we flew this mission, got her PhD using Hubble data some years later. So she's one of the thousands of young scientists that have been nurtured by Hubble in its time. Perfect time. And uh, I think we have some time for some questions. So. It, the one thing I'll say is um, so, many, so many people, particularly my astronomer friends uh, over the years have come up and, you know, I have to shake your hand and, and thank you for fixing Hubble. And all I could say was it's, it was a pleasure, <laughs> truly. Call us again. <laughs> <laughs> it would be like Space Cowboys meets the HST. It would be awesome. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery with the Hubble Space Telescope, our window on the universe.
It's uh, about humanity's quest for knowledge. The only way of finding the limits of the possible is by going beyond them into the impossible. I want to wish Hubble its own set of adventures that it may unlock further mysteries of the universe. Thank you.